Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here this morning, particularly proud to be a board member of Tech Parks Arizona. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to be talking about the COVID-19 crisis. I'm going to start with the disease, then focus on the numbers, then the diagnostics, and end with a discussion of where we go from here, particularly around back to work. First, it's critical to look at the disease versus the virus itself. When we look at the virus, it's called SARS-CoV-2, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. It's called coronavirus because the first person that saw it under an microscope looked at it and thought it looked like a crown and called it corona, as that is the Latin word for crown. That is the virus itself, but it causes a disease called COVID-19. We are obviously all familiar with that, but to give you a sense of what happens with that disease, this is a 77-year-old gentleman, starts off in day five with relatively clear lungs. Day 15, you can begin to see infiltrate in his lungs. Day 20, much more infection and fluid in the lungs, and unfortunately, he died on day 30. This is what the disease is. But I get a lot of questions about, is this really just a very bad flu? So let me compare this with the flu. First, the number of cases. Two million in COVID-19, and we are by no means at the end of this pandemic. Compared to the worst flu season in the last 10 years, 2017, 2018, and that's 45 million. The number hospitalized was about four times higher by the end of that season than we've had to date in COVID-19, but it's critical to understand that the length of stay for COVID patients averages around 20 days, with the length of stay for flu patients averages only four days. But the real difference comes in the number of deaths. In COVID-19, we've had more than 110,000 deaths to date. In the entire flu season of those two, seasons, two years, we had 61,000 deaths. And the death rate, well, in COVID-19, just over 5.5%. In the flu of 17 and 18, 0.14%. Um, in the worst flu seasons we've seen, it's hovering just under 1%. So dramatic difference. This is not just like another flu. So how bad is it? Well, the devastating impact is clear. Almost 2 million cases with more than 112,000 deaths throughout the US and clearly many, many more throughout the world. What has changed? Well, the epidemic began on the coasts in the major cities on the East and the West Coast. But what's changed, particularly in the last month, is the hotspots have moved from the major cities to the secondary cities, particularly in the Midwest and the South. And what you'll see here is the darker colors, the orange and red, are showing where the infection rates are going up. So how do we measure this? What is the testing all about? Well, if we start with the beginning of the pandemic, March 1st, we did 125 tests in our country. Today, we're close to 500,000 tests per day. Over the entire pandemic, the positive rate is about 9.5%, but not surprisingly, with more testing proportionally, the positive rate goes down. In the last seven days, it's just over 4%. But when we talk about the US, it's not a monolith. It is a very different country, state by state. No surprise here, but when you look at the states that have tested the most, Rhode Island, New York, New Mexico, they are well above 75 or 100 tests per thousand. When you look at the lower states, and unfortunately this is where Arizona is, we've moved up from 47th and 48th, but still low in the totem pole here, we are still well below the average of 65 tests per thousand residents. So what is happening in Arizona? Well, as of last night, we had more than 28,000 cases and more than 1,000 deaths. Unfortunately, we have seen a very significant spike in the last two weeks. As a matter of fact, 13 of our highest 15 case days have been in the last two weeks. 
From the death rate, it's been up and down. Happily, the death rate has not risen as aggressively as the case rate. What we believe is happening is the cases that are coming in now are less severe than the earlier cases. The only positive news I can find. When you look at what's happened in Arizona, unfortunately, so much of the recent spike has happened since the state has started to reopen. Are the policies wrong? Was it right to reopen? There are a lot of debate here, but what I could say is the only way to get this second surge under control is to test, to trace, to track, and to treat. And we need to have constant vigilance not just your neighbor, not just the guy across the street. We all need to be constantly vigilant because there are so many people who are asymptomatic, who could spread disease. In my mind, that's social distancing and masks. The only little bit of good news here um, is when you look at hospital admissions, and I mentioned this earlier, hospital admissions have gone down. So today, 12% of known cases are hospitalized. 61% though, and this is probably a surprise to many people, it was to me, 60% of the people in hospitals are considered low risk. They have no chronic conditions and they're under 65 years of age. In addition, I think it would surprise a lot of people that of the 3,400 admissions in our state, one third of those patients remain inpatient today. But the good news is there is some inpatient occupancy. We went as low as 13%. We are now up to 22% of our beds are available for additional COVID-19 patients. And just this morning, the state reenacted the Hospital Emergency Act, which ensures that there will be space for COVID-19 patients. So the rallying call throughout this pandemic, especially in the U.S., has been diagnostics, diagnostics, test, test, test. Not a surprise. Well, what tests are out there? Well, my firm has what I believe to be the largest database in the U.S., and it now has 997 tests in that database. 60% of these tests are looking for the virus, 40% the antibody, variety of different technologies, and like a pandemic, the tests themselves are sourced from all over the world. How has the FDA dealt with so many tests? Most of us are familiar with the fact that diagnostics is a highly regulated industry. Well, there are three stages. The first stage is what I call regulation as usual. The FDA changed very little, if anything. It was business as usual. The FDA was actually one of the last public agencies to declare an emergency, and that did not happen until March 25th. We then went through 10 weeks of what I will call denial, and there was unprecedented relaxation of rules. States were able to approve tests. Tests were able to get onto the market before they submitted any data to the FDA to get an emergency use authorization. So tests were out there and they were available to the public without being screened by the FDA. The FDA then went through eight re weeks of regret and in a stage that I call now cautious retrenchment. And the FDA, and I'm thrilled about this, have said they're going to crack down on tests, particularly serology tests, with a variety of minimum standards that a test has to make. They also have been aggressive in taking tests off the market. Just 10 days ago, they took 27 tests off the market. I think this is good for our country, good for all of us as potential patients. So with so many tests, what do I do? What's the difference between a viral test and an antibody test? Does it matter if they take it, the sample from my nose or my throat? And how do we use testing moving forward? So let me try to answer those questions. First, it's critical to emphasize that diagnostics are powerful at every stage of this disease. First, how vulnerable is that patient? Is there a genetic component here? But then I'm gonna focus on the 
the questions that are most in everyone's mind. Is the asymptomatic person infected? Is the symptomatic person infected? Is the therapy working or is the virus winning? Do I have neutralizing antibodies? And lastly, a question that has not had much discussion, but I believe will become more and more relevant, which is, has the virus gained or lost virulence, i.e., has it mutated or not? So let's focus on the two very different but basic questions that require two very different tests. First, do I have COVID-19? And secondly, do I have antibodies to the virus SARS-CoV-2? The virus question will be on the left and it will be in red. And the question we're asking there is, is the virus present? We first looked at these patients and we only diagnosed them through X-ray or CT. We then moved to looking for the viral RNA and now the antigens. On the antibody side, which will typically be on the right and in green, the question is, do I have antibodies to fight this virus? And this is important not just after someone recovers, but during the symptom phase to see who is winning. What is the so what here? The so what for the viral test is no false negatives. You never ever wanna miss a case. You don't wanna tell someone that they don't have the disease when they do. On the antibody side, it's different. We want to find no false positives. We want to ensure that immune really means immune. So why is this important? Well, if we look at the study of patients, we'll see on day one, 100% of patients, not surprisingly, have the virus and they can detect it through tests. 50% have antibodies even at that point. And over a period of three weeks, the virus fights with the antibodies. The typical crossover day is at day 12, where the virus starts to regress and there's less and less virus and fewer and fewer patients with virus. And the antibodies start to increase with more and more patients. What's interesting here, and may not be intuitive, a patient may have very few symptoms, but one third of them are still viral positive at the end of 21 days. While the average disease discussed is at 14 days, I know from personal experience with my family, several of my family members had the disease into 30, 35, and even 40 days. Are these patients infectious at day 21? We don't know. The thought is probably not because it's a low level of virus, but we can't be entirely sure. So let's go back to those tests and explain the pros and cons of the different tests. The virus tests, again, in red, are considered non-invasive, but they're very accurate. If you can get to the source inside the body and pick up viral copies, it will pick up as few as 100 viral copies. And to give you a sense of how important that is, what do positive swabs from patients have? 300,000 copies of the virus. So, so very accurate, but the sampling is difficult and the technique is critical. On the immunoassays in green on the right, this is all about taking blood. Now the good news here is taking blood is easy. We know how to do that, whether it's a finger stick or a blood serum tube. So the technique is not the issue. The issue here is the design of the test. More about that in a few minutes. So as we look back to the viral tests on the left, what do they look like? What is the most common test and how does it work? Well, if you haven't had one, I'm sorry to show you this photograph. It hurts just looking at it. This is a very long swab tickling the brain, going to the very back of the nasal cavity. But that's not the only place that the virus can be sampled. It could be sampled in the nose, the throat, saliva, or the trachea. But how effective are they? Well, oral swabs, not typically used anymore because they're not very effective. These nasal swabs that I just showed you the picture, they work about two thirds of the time. There's nothing wrong with the swab, but what that means is it's not hitting the right place to pick up virus or for any reason the, the virus is not largely pleasant, present in that part of the anatomy. Sputum works, but that's only if you can cough up sputum and then be able to spit that out. 
Unfortunately, for many patients, they don't have a productive cough. They have quite a dry cough. But what about saliva? Wouldn't it be so much easier if we can test with saliva? Well, saliva has been quite a controversial testing medium. The effectiveness of saliva is in dispute. The earlier studies said, no, it will not work. But recent studies, two in the last month, have said saliva actually captures more virus than those nasal swabs. More work to do here, but I believe we will see more saliva tests moving forward. How does it work? The second question that I get all the time is, can I do this at home? Why don't we have a home test? Well, let me describe what's happened today and what I believe will happen in the future. First, sample collection. That is just beginning to be available at home or what I call DIY. Again, red or viral tests. So you can get a nasal swab or a throat swab. Again, it's difficult to do. There are a few companies that'll do it. You do the swab, you put it in a box, you put it in an envelope and you send it out to the company. Same with sputum or saliva. It's meant to be a, a morning cough, which is the most useful cough. It's the least invasive, not clear whether it works and this is part of the debate. But again, you cough it up, put it in a tube, put it in an envelope and send it away. For the finger stick blood, this is green and antibody test. This is similar to what diabetics do with blood glucose monitoring. And it's a very common technique, but again, no test has been approved yet. But what would happen is you put your blood into a finger stick and send it off. What about a full test at home? That's just sampling. Um, there are none right now. The FDA pulled four off the market early and said they did not work. But I believe there will be both antibody and viral antigen tests available in the next several months. This is an example of an HIV test that is an antibody test and it can be done at home. So the technology is possible. There are many companies working on this, but none approved to date. So those are the challenges for the viral test. What about the antibody test? Well, at the top here is a cartoon showing the genome of SARS-CoV-2. And what's important here is if you look at that genome and you compare it to a bat coronavirus, you see there's about 96% overlap. That's why we call it and what we believe that this came from the bat. But more relevant to people, is the fact that there are in total seven other coronaviruses. This chart shows five of them, and it shows that there's tremendous overlap with the other coronaviruses and the current SARS-CoV-2. So it's critical to make sure that the antibody test tells you you have antibodies for this coronavirus, not others. And it's important to note that one of those seven coronaviruses is indeed the common cold. So what's the other challenge with antibody tests? It's the false positive rate. The false positive rate sounds pretty low for a pretty good test at 97%, only 3% false positive. But you have to go back to your college statistics to say this false positive rate is only relevant to the percent of patients that could be false positive, i.e. it doesn't impact those that are truly positive. And you can see this in New York City, where they have 21% of the population is indeed truly positive. They are 3% only accounts for 10% of the tests. But if you look on Tucson or Santa Clara County, California, and in Tucson very recently, U of A, did a test of 6,000 patients and found a prevalence rate of only 1.2% of the population. That would mean this false positive rate could be wrong as much as 66% of the time. What do we do about this? It's not that it's a bad test because we're trying to improve the test, but if I got a false if I got a positive test from an antibody and didn't previously have symptoms and had no reason to really believe that I had coronavirus, 
what I would do is get a second test. And with a second positive, I would feel more confident that indeed it is accurate. So that gives you a sense of the testing. Where do we go from here as a society? I think there are five things that we need to do. Number one, test, test, test. And I believe to materially change testing from the current levels, we need to do this in partnership with private industry. Number two, treatment protocols. They need to be shared broadly and they need to be shared quickly and not just in the US but across the world. Third, trace all contacts of the infected. If there is a positive, we need to trace the contacts and limit the infection rate. Speaking of limiting the infection rate, I think if we do this well, we don't need the horizontal, everyone sheltering in place. We could do what I call vertical quarantining, only quarantine the vulnerable and the infectious. And lastly, Prepare for the next surge. It will happen. It may not be in Arizona, but it will happen. And prepare for the next epidemic. That will also happen. In the last hundred years, we've had five epidemics. Most of them were not as nearly as aggressive in the US, but there will be more as our population travels more and lives in highly dense areas. So where do we go as a business? I'll go through the basics quickly and then talk about the details. I believe in a universal masking policy. Um, as somebody who talks a lot, it's hard for me to tell you this, but it's true. Talking is the most dangerous act. We emit particles from our mouths when we talk, and therefore it is critical to be wearing a universal masking policy. No, you don't need a mask when you're sitting alone at your desk, but you do when you're walking around the office. Talking about walking around the office, offices will need to be reconfigured to give people more space, more air circulation, and limiting meetings. And lastly, in the basics, creating this strong and healthy workplace where management acknowledges the fear and stress and over communicates at all levels and encourages direct feedback after education and training employees. But what about the details here? I think there are also three areas that are critical. Number one, segmenting your workforce, understanding who has rare, occasional, or most importantly, frequent interaction with the public. Also, internal interaction. You can't forget that. Who are the people in your company that need to be talking to other employees? Next, think about your market prevalence. Are you here in Tucson where the prevalence is likely to be low? Maybe it goes up a little bit when students come back, but overall it's low. It's very different than if you're in an environment like New York City. Next, contractor and vendor policies. Um, this is critical and often forgotten. I just read about a story where a company did everything right, but didn't qualify its vendors. Someone came in who was sick and infected a large percent of the population. So when you think about your workforce, you have to think of the entire workforce. Next, implement a testing strategy, but it's important to do this after you've segmented your workforce and you know who you need to test. I would consider the viral antigen tests for a faster turnaround time, 15 to 20 minutes. It's better than temperature, it's worse than the nasal swabs, but it's better than doing nothing if you need to do it on site. I would use contact tracing. I know there are issues around privacy and a company needs to implement this carefully and appropriately, but it's far better to know if one is likely to get infected. And lastly, consider alternative work schedules. My favorite is splitting your workforce into thirds, and or quarters, having one group work four days and then have 10 days off where they're working at home to minimize the spread. If anyone gets sick during those four days, it is highly likely they will start to have symptoms during those 10 days and therefore would not come back to work for the next four day shift. Lastly, I would require daily self-implemented health checklists. There are a number of apps out there that go through the CDC checklist. 
that each employee would look at it. And even though they say they're doing it, it is more effective to have them read a checklist and say, yes, yes, yes. Oh, well, maybe. Yes, yes. And then decide to go to work depending on that answer for that checklist. I would, I think it's highly effective, easy to do, and literally a two minute list. So what's on the horizon as I conclude, and I'm happy to take questions, I believe that there are six things that we need to look out for in the future. Number one, additional surges. They are inevitable, but blanket shelter in place will not be required. Next, I talked about this, testing, tracing, and isolation will be used, but not consistently. So private industry, you'll have to implement it on your own. Vaccine. I'm hopeful, but I have to acknowledge that for the last 50 years, we've been looking for vaccines for coronaviruses, including the common cold, but it has not worked. I hope I'm wrong here. I think if there is a vaccine, it is likely not to be a one and done. I don't think there'll be any impact on vaccines in 2020 and maybe not in 2021 either. And what I mean by not a one and done, if the virus like most other viruses mutates over time, you will need a booster shot like the flu, a new vaccine every year. Next on test quality, I believe it'll improve with better protocols from the FDA. Home testing, it will be broadly used. I think it'll be saliva and finger stick, and you'll be able to do collection and full testing at home. And lastly, we will have a flu season. I wish that somehow that would go away, but there's no reason to believe it would. So I believe that we will see broad panels that look for SARS-CoV-2, respiratory virus, as well as influenza A and B. And that will be the best way to protect our society going forward. So with that, I say thank you. If you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me. And I appreciate the great work that UA Tech Parks is doing to keep all of us as our community healthy and safe. Thank you.